This is my grandfather, Frederick Charles Faulkner, known as Fred. He had an interesting life, and I think we can learn something from his time and his experiences. For me, his story certainly contains one significant life lesson that I remember often. Fred was born in 1889 in Lee Green, in what at the time was, and in places still is, a leafy green suburb to the south of London. The centre of the town was defined by two pubs at a crossroads. One was called the Old Tiger's Head, and rather unimaginatively, the one on the other corner was the New Tiger's Head. Both of these pubs still exist to this day, and they would certainly have been known to Fred as a young man. Lee Green was also the end terminus for trams, taking workers from the area into central London, a distance of about 12 miles. Just up the road was open countryside and farms, since the urban sprawl we know today only began after the First World War. In fact, Lee Green wasn't even part of London. Then it still belonged to the rural county of Kent. The area was partly populated by wealthy families, many of whom had businesses in the capital. They lived in the big houses, nowadays either demolished or converted into offices. In the streets surrounding these were the middle and working classes who were either employed in the city or provided the labour and services for the wealthy families. Fred Faulkner was a butcher's boy, and as such, every day except Sunday, he would pedal his bike with the big basket on the front to deliver meat to the big houses. There were no fridges or freezers in those days. Of course, he didn't ride up to the front door. He would need to go around to the back to the servants' entrance. It's said that he was always cheerful, whistling or singing as he went on his rounds. In one of the big houses, there worked a pretty little servant girl called Edith Jesson. She came from the nearby town of Forest Hill, and her father was an official on the railways. As nature and Fred's winning ways took their course, young Ed, as she was called, started seeing Fred on their infrequent days off, and finally they were married in 1911. The group picture of their wedding is rather interesting. Since Edith's parents, her sisters and her brother were all there, but we can't see Fred's parents, although we know they were still alive at the time. His two sisters and their children were present though. It's a family mystery that will probably never be solved. Of particular interest in the picture is that 18 year old young man in the back row. He was also a Fred and was Edith's kid brother. We'll talk about him later. Nature further took its course, and Fred and Ede had a daughter, Florence, known as Floss, although she apparently hated the name, who was born in August 1913. In the picture, which was probably taken towards the end of 1914 or early the following year, it's worth noting the rather sad expressions. No one's exactly saying cheese here, and there could be a reason, since something is missing from the photograph. Unlike most men at the start of the Great War, including Edith's brother, Fred Faulkner wasn't wearing a military uniform. Not that he didn't want to volunteer, he tried on numerous occasions, but being by that time a qualified butcher, he was in what was called a reserved occupation. That didn't help with the embarrassment though. Not only was the nation flooded with recruiting posters and men parading in their uniforms, but some women would typically hand a white feather to men who were dressed in civvies and had not joined up. Later on in the war, men who refused to join the armed forces were called conscientious objectors or conchies and put into internment camps. Right throughout the war, Fred still tried his best to join up even volunteering for the infamous Black and Tans that were sent to Ireland to put down the Easter Uprising, but each time he was refused. Fred Jesson, however, was by this time in France. He had left his good job on the railways, organised for him by his father, and volunteered for the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, along with several of his friends. After going through the horrors of the Somme, he was posted to Gallipoli. We see several photos of him in tropical kit, 
and he wrote at least one card from the front to his sister Ede that still survives to this day. He appears to have achieved the rank of sergeant, and the LG chevron on his sleeve shows that he was a qualified Lewis gunner, part of a team of three. Sadly though, Frederick Jessen did not survive the war, and he died in a military hospital near Basra in present-day Iraq on the 12th of April 1919, aged 26. Family folklore has it that this was a breakpoint in the relationship between my grandparents, with Edith definitely bearing a grudge that her husband had had such an easy war whereas her little brother had died. It seems that Fred was looking to escape from home and in 1920 he joined the Merchant Navy as a ship's butcher. His first ship was the Kaiser Hein, belonging to the prestigious p and line. He sailed regularly to the Far East and Australia, often being away for months at a time. He seems to have missed his only daughter, though, and sent her regular greetings and telegrams. The Kaiser Hein was an old ship, having been used as a troop carrier during the war. So when she was decommissioned, Fred was promoted to chief butcher and transferred to the SS Royal Pindy. This ship became his real home. And although he enjoyed some holidays with Ede by the south coast of England, he was always keen to get back to his buddies on the Raw Pindy. Fred had always been a bit of a gambler, and alongside his regular butcher's work on the ship, he also developed a sideline of taking bets on the horses. In fact, his passion for horse racing and gambling was further fed by the Raw Pindy stopovers in Bombay, now Mumbai where he rubbed shoulders with Maharajas and the elite. Note that his jaunty smile seems to have returned. Apparently, life was a bit of a roller coaster for the Faulkners, since Edith never knew if Fred would come home flush with money or virtually penniless. In fact, the only way she could tell was how he arrived. If a taxi pulled up outside the front door, then it was a profitable voyage and all was well. If he was just walking down the road carrying his suitcase, it was a different story. Fred was very generous though, and on the good days he would buy jewellery for both his wife and daughter, as well as coming back loaded with treasures from Japan, India and other exotic countries he sailed to. And of course, he never forgot his daughter's birthday. But it was not to last. In the summer of 1939, the storm clouds of war were gathering, and the Royal Pindy, along with many other British merchant ships, was requisitioned by the Royal Navy for conversion to an armed merchant cruiser. In the case of the Royal Pindy, this just meant the addition of some armour plating, the installation of a few obsolete guns left over from the First World War, and the removal of one of the ship's funnels. Fred Faulkner was then given a choice. He was, by this time, aged 50, and could have taken early retirement, or been given a desk job at P&O headquarters in London. But because of the burden of shame he was still carrying from the First World War, he took a third option and signed on as chief butcher of what was to become HMS Royal Pindy. He had something to prove and show to the world that the white feathers were misplaced. Whilst the conversion work on the ship was going on, Fred and Ede took the opportunity for a short holiday in late summer by the sea at Margate on the south coast of England. HMS Royal Pindy was commissioned into the Royal Navy on the 19th of September 1939, and in early October Fred received orders to rejoin his ship. There was quite a farewell party with all the family present, with Fred and Ede's sisters, their husbands and children, and of course my mother, who'd married a couple of years earlier. Fred then sent all his kit on ahead and set about saying goodbye to everyone. This picture was taken in the late autumn of 1939, before all the metal from the gates and the fences was taken for the war effort. We can thus imagine Fred's last view of the family home, even the neat garden at the rear. 
The role of the Royal Pindy was to provide protection for the convoys that were sailing between the United States and the British Isles. It was vital to maintain these routes for essential war supplies as well as food, and the convoys often included dozens of ships. Things started pretty well for the Royal Pindy. On the 19th of October, while patrolling in the Denmark Strait, she intercepted a German oil tanker which was then scuttled by her crew, taking her valuable cargo of oil from South America to the bottom of the sea. However, the good fortune didn't last. Just over a month later, at 15.30 on a foggy afternoon on the 23rd of November 1939, the Raw Pindy was patrolling midway between Iceland and the Faroes. The captain received a message from the lookout in the crow's nest that an enemy ship had been sighted on the horizon. Believing the ship to be the German battleship Deutschland, the captain ordered action stations, followed swiftly by the command to change course to port. The duty radio officer was told to send an enemy sighting report and the Royal Pindy steered full speed towards the shelter of nearby fog banks. Smoke floats were lit and thrown into the water, but unfortunately they failed to properly ignite. The captain then ordered a course change to where a large iceberg, about four miles away, held out a better promise of protection. But it was too late. It wasn't the Deutschland, but rather the German battlecruiser Scharnhorst that was fast approaching, cutting off Rorpindi's escape route. The Scharnhorst flashed a light signal for the Rorpindi to heave to, backing it up with a warning shell that sent up a fountain of spray some 75 metres in front of Rorpindi's bows. Through the fog, the Scharnhorst was joined by her sister ship, the Greisenhau. Again, the German ship's bridge flashed a heave-to warning, and again, the message was ignored. In part because at that very moment, a second ship had been sighted to starboard, and Captain Edward Kennedy, an experienced retired officer who had rejoined the Navy at the start of the war, believed it to be a fellow member of the Northern Patrol, possibly a British heavy cruiser, but he was much mistaken. The Royal Pindy, a hastily converted passenger liner with outdated guns and eggshell armour was about to take on two of the mightiest warships in the German Navy. Captain Hoffman ordered the signal abandoned ship to be sent, but to his astonishment the Royal Pindy also failed to respond to this message. Was the captain mad? Surely no sane person would pit eight obsolete six-inch guns against the combined weight of 18 modern 11-inch monsters firing at almost point-blank range of only four miles? With a mixture of bewilderment and silent admiration, Hoffman commanded the abandoned ship signal to be repeated. It was twice, and twice it went unheeded. With a heavy heart, Hoffman prepared to give the signal for the Scharnhorst to open fire. But it was a moment too late. A salvo of six-inch shells from the Royal Pindy's four port guns burst harmlessly against the Gneisenau. At the same moment, a similar salvo was on its way to Hoffman's ship. It was 1545. Barely a quarter of an hour had gone by since Royal Pindy sighted the first of the enemy vessels. In another 25 minutes, it would be all over. The first salvo from the Scharnhorst slammed into the boat deck directly under the bridge, killing almost everyone on it, including Captain Kennedy, and demolishing the radio room. A cluster of 11-inch shells then struck the main gun control station, killing everyone there and immobilising one of her starboard guns. Caught in such a murderous crossfire, the Royal Pindy had no hope of survival. A shell then burst in the ship's engine room, knocking out the dynamos, supplying vital electric power. It was hopeless. HMS Raw Pindy was doomed. By now, fires were blazing everywhere, the ship's water supply had failed, and its steering gear was out of action. There was no option but to abandon ship. A lifeboat was filled with some 40 wounded men and prepared for lowering into the sea. 
but it turned turtle and hit the water upside down, leaving the men to flounder helplessly in the freezing wave. Some others were more successful, and for a moment it seemed as though a good number of the crew would escape their ship's doom. It was not to be. At 1600, a tremendous explosion blew the gallant merchant cruiser apart. One of Scharnhorst's 11-inch guns had found the forward magazine. With her spine broken in half, the stricken vessel began to sink, one of its guns still firing crazily into the air. Tragically, for those trying to get clear of the sinking ship, the Scharnhorst, having closed in for the kill, swung hard about, swamping the lifeboats. Then, in keeping with naval chivalry, the German battlecruiser reduced speed and returned to rescue the survivors struggling in the freezing sea. Darkness was fast falling on this melancholy drama when the last survivors were plucked from a watery grave. A Pathé newsreel issued just after the event showed some of those survivors. The fight of HMS Royal Pindy against the battleship Deutschland will live on as one of the heroic battles of this war. Ten survivors come out onto the Horse Guards Parade in London. Ten men who fought against overwhelming odds until their ship sank beneath them with colours flying. And the second Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Charles Little, comes out to thank them on behalf of the Navy and the nation, to tell them that the whole empire is proud of them. The newsreel, however, contains a couple of errors. Firstly, the photo of the Royal Pindy was taken pre-war and shows two funnels instead of the one left after the conversion. The commentator also refers to the battleship Deutschland, not to the Scharnhorst, the same mistake that appeared in the newspaper headlines. This was, of course, due to the first radio signal sent by the captain of the Royal Pindy, who mistook the two ships. The number of survivors varies. Some reports say 38, others say 17, but the chief butcher wasn't one of them. Along with at least 237 crewmen, he had perished that afternoon. Fred Faulkner, however, died in bed in his sleep in 1981, aged 92. So what happened? Well, at the very last moment before his departure for the Royal Pindy, he received another telegram from the Admiralty telling him that his orders had been changed and he was to transfer to a P&O sister ship, the HMS Strathmore. Fred was furious. Not only was all his kit on the Royal Pindy, but also many of his friends and, of course, the gambling business. Strathmore, however, went all the way through the war without a scratch. This is part of Fred's logbook from 1941. Not only did she sail with the convoys, she was also used as a troop ship, even bringing home hundreds of former British prisoners of war from Singapore in 1945. At the end of the conflict, she underwent a refit again becoming the SS Strathmore, and along with her sister ships, the Strathaird and the Strathedon, returned to her peacetime duties sailing between Britain, the Far East and Australia. And of course, happily back amongst the crew for the next few years was Frederick Charles Faulkner, Chief Butcher. So the life lesson? Just sometimes, when things don't quite seem to be going the way we planned, we need to accept the changes. They could be for the best, and indeed might even be life-saving. Bye-bye, all the best. How's it?